Ha ha! Come one, come all! The Clash Royale League is now in the European region. Today's first match features the French phenoms of Allegiance against the red hot second ranked Team Dignitas. Rising star Doberman leads Allegiance into battle, while the golden haired golden boy IMJP aims to keep Dignitas riding high. Let's settle this one with a duel! Hello and welcome to Clash Royale League. I'm Rich Slayton. Joining me is Andrew Guy. We are midway through our fourth week here at CRL in the European region. And Andrew, the standings in the middle are oh so close. Oh yeah, Rich. Right here, if you look at the very middle of the pack, there's so many teams that are just within one game of each other. And of course, the big outliers. Misfits on the bottom, of course, looking for their first win this week. And Team Queso on top at 5-0, not looking for their first loss probably ever. Those top four teams will make it to our playoffs. The winner of those playoffs will represent Europe in the World Finals. And of course, you can follow all the action by hitting subscribe on the Clash Royale Esports YouTube page, going to esports.clashroyale.com, or going to the Esports tab in your Clash Royale app. And for two teams today, the journey continues. Of course, we have Team Dignitas trying to make it a secure spot at the number two in our leaderboard against Allegiance. Yeah, Allegiance coming off of a week where they were one and one, so not the worst week. You know, it's always good to get a win in there. We've got Doberman, Donkey Kong, Lupanji, and Wiko, and of course, they're opponents. Team Dignitas, a great 2-0 week last week, beating G2 and Misfits. We've got Wonka, Max Lemonas, Messi, and of course I am JP. The big story from Dignitas being the 5-0 King of the Hill run that I am JP is currently on. A fantastic team, though he seems to be carrying at the moment. And our friend Christy St. John is standing by with I am JP. Thanks, guys. I am JP. So last week, Allegiance had a really strong showing against Fnatic. Fnatic, of course, the only team that you've lost to. So is there anything in that match that helped you prepare for today? I mean, anything that scares you? Que básicamente eh, Allegiance fue un equipo que eh, viene muy fuerte la semana pasada, que venció a Fnatic, los cuales nos venció a nosotros. Eh, ¿Estás asustado o te has preparado de alguna forma especial para este encuentro? No, no creo que esté asustado. Eh, sabemos que todos los equipos de esta liga son muy buenos, eh, tienen jugadores muy, muy, muy buenos y estrategia que nos hemos planteado para, para este partido simplemente el uno contra uno específicamente porque Doberman usa diferentes arquetipos de mazos. Sí, simplemente nos preparamos eh, en los partidos contra gente específica, pero no ninguna estrategia. Así. Okay. He said that we are not scared of any team, of course. Uh, we prepare and respect all of, of our opponents. And just for this match, we do the same that always prepare for each set, uh, the best that we can. All right, a lot of respect. Muchas gracias. Thank Back you. to you guys. No fear for Team Dignitas, of course, up against a beast in Allegiance. Both teams getting their lineups and rosters and, of course, those card bands set to find out what they're planning. Let's take a look inside the war rooms. All right, boys, take seats. All right, Allegiance. It's another team that's in the way. They need to be moved. I want that four and one. Understood? All right, bands for 2v2, double tornado ban. It's, okay. it's good for us. We know what we want to play. We prepared for this. Mm. I mean, tornado is the staple ban in 2v2. Mm. JP, he, they ban Pekka. It's easy. easy, it's good. Any, any questions, boys? No. Nothing. We're good. All right, boys. On three. One, two, three. Dig Dig win. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour. Bonjour. Euh, du coup, je vais juste vite fait parler des bans. 2v2, double tornade. Euh, Anis, Lucas, c'est vous qui jouez. Voilà, vous savez pas jouer. Euh, pour le 1v1, PK et... Royalogs. Exactement. Tu sais quoi jouer. Et euh, maintenant, je vais passer la parole à Samir qui va nous faire le petit discours. C'est quoi, avec Bon, allez, les gars, j'espère que vous êtes prêts et tout. Les, les deux derniers matchs, euh, certes, on a perdu contre Kesso, mais c'était un match très prometteur parce qu'on a montré de très belles choses. Donc, euh, je, je sais pas, je, je sens qu'aujourd'hui, vous êtes dans, dans un bon jour. On a bien travaillé, on est confiant. Donc là, on, on se met pas de pression, juste on y va, on montre euh, ce qu'on sait faire, ce qu'on sait faire de mieux de jouer. Et voilà, quoi. You've seen them in the tunnel. You've watched them in their war rooms. You've seen them listen to their coaches. Wait, I have a novel idea. 
Let's see them play for crying out loud. Dignitas and Allegiance, send your 2v2 tandems into battle. Fantastic idea, King. Let's see them play. Indeed, 2v2 about to get underway. And uh, no surprises here on the lineups. Yeah, both of these teams sticking with their duos. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Now, the duos have had interesting starts here at Cyril. Now, one and two, two and two, six and eight. Though They have records kind of all the way across the board. I think now what they're really doing is sticking with the duos that are working and trying to separate that from the pack. You know, I spoke with Team Dignitas's, uh, sorry, with uh, Team Allegiance's coach, Romain, talking about this 2v2 matchup of Wiko and Lupanji. He said this is really where they think uh, that Allegiance has the best chance of success. And a big part of that is communication. Now, that does bring up the big question of what happened with that 11 HP in their last match. Right, and I, and I believe you said that they made a small mistake and they owned up to it, and that happens. That happens here on a professional level. It happens at, a, at an amateur level. It always is going to happen in the game. It's about how you bounce back, and Dignitas is ready to do that exactly. Vamos. The opening set on its way. The card bands, of course, you saw a moment ago. Double tornado, so leaving a lot of spells on the board there, Andrew. Yeah, we, uh, <clears throat> we usually see a tornado and a poison or maybe even a fireball, but double tornado makes a lot of sense. It has such a powerful uh, place here in 2v2, although we haven't even really seen it been played much because it's always banned. Now, interesting note, the, 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 one of those super, almost over-aggressive Royal Hog plays right out the gate, getting that left tower down to 13.47. Yeah, and you see that uh, Allegiance there was kind of trying to decide how they wanted to defend it, and this is one of those rough things where you really want to get your Golem down in front of your Night Witch, but you play the Golem anyway, it's behind. Double Golems in this 2v2 is going to make it so it does get to the tower, but normally that is not an ideal situation. Well, so far, looking like it's Dignitas' Wonka and Max Lamanas looking to be the team to solve the double golem riddle and maybe try to shift our meta in 2v2 to its next phase. Yeah, we saw that uh, initial Royal Hogs might have felt a little aggressive and that's why they couldn't defend so well, but they find themselves basically tied in damage here. So uh, great opening exchange for both teams. So far, Max and Wonka two and two overall on their CR record and game record is six and six. So they are razor thin so far with their 2v2 experience. Yeah, that's what I was trying to kind of try to articulate before the match uh, was that these, these duos are really great together, but they're really trying to separate themselves from the rest of the teams that are that are having a negative win record. Because, look, if you're going to stick with a duo, you don't want them to be batting 500. You don't want them to be even. You want them to really be two to one ratios, ideally, throughout the rest of this season. Well, interesting note, again, talking to uh, Allegiance's coach, Romain, about what was happening with, with their whole lineup. And he said that he was very open and honest that they didn't take 2v2 as seriously at the opening of the season because they didn't realize how important it would be. They figured with their lineup, 1v1 and King of the Hill, they could get it and kind of throw 2v2 to the wind and see what happens. Yeah, man, and I, I, I couldn't disagree more, and, and I understand why they're recognizing it now. Now, in the beginning of the season, I said I was not a believer, but winning your 2v2 set sets the pace for the rest of the match. You kind of have a cushion going into your 1v1, which is the bread and butter, and it's only two out of three. It's not three out of five, so separating yourself in that 2v2 set really helps the rest of the match. That miner getting a lot of work done, good timing to, to, to put that there against the double golem push. And now we're seeing also uh, this Inferno Tower, Inferno Dragon combination trying to stop. And that was a big misplay, that fireball just getting the Magic Archer, not getting the Inferno Dragon. Yeah, you really, really want to hit that Inferno Dragon as well. That way you can throw down a Zap to reset it, and you've got it almost down. That Miner is definitely doing an incredible amount of work, getting that direct damage. And honestly, I think that Fireball is going to be the game changer. Final five seconds here. That Fireball, was that the entire thing? And did we just see the Golem Breaker deck finally make its way into 2v2? It's tough to say because, again, that missed Fireball was such a big deal. And here's that very open opening play. Super aggressive with the Miner on the tower. The Night Witch and the Princess Tower are focused on it. That way the Royal Hogs get to do work. You see him allocate a zap. It's just not enough. Or excuse me. You see uh, Dignitas allocate a zap to get rid of those bats. But right here, the missed fireball. Look, you get the Magic Archer, but come on. Well, you just straight miss the Inferno Dragon. And, and the Baby Dragon would have taken out the Inferno with that fireball, meaning that those golems probably would have gotten to the tower much, much healthier. And we'd probably be still copying out the game. We'd still be in an overtime in that sudden death period. Yes. And at that point, now look, 
Uh, Dignitas was playing that deck uh, very, very well, doing a good job with it, but Allegiance did have double Golem in double Elixir time. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things. Double Golem is always really tough to defend against. They did it. They kept it up. The Miner did work. Let's see what happens here in match number two. Game number two on its way. Reminder, Dignitas is Wonka and Max Lemanas at the top of your screen. Wiko and Lupanji representing the French squad Allegiance at the bottom. Lava Hound's been banned a lot this week. It's going to be interesting to see exactly how Dignitas is going to utilize it today. Wait, a lot. Lava Hound, another, missed, another fireball. missed fireball. Wow. Guys, I understand you want to get these troops down, but these are really big misplays early on, especially when you're in single elixir or miss fireball. Look at this. Two miners on the tower, a Lava Hound, a baby dragon, and an inferno dragon. This is, this is a really, really bad place for Allegis to be in. Very difficult position, and... You know, with, with so many options on the board in terms of spells, uh, it's, you, you think that you, that you really make the best use of those. And unfortunately here, uh, not picking that one up. First tower down. And if we look at this deck construction, right, we see what Dignitas uh, is playing right now, a slower, heavier deck. Uh, I wonder if there's going to be a lot of opening. Now that the double royal hog push on the right-hand side, but nicely picked up by by the tombstone, some spells. I'm just wondering if Allegiance can get back in this thing. I mean, th these Royal Hogs are doing a great amount of work. I, I believe Dignitas did not think that they were going to get through the tombstone that easily, and they thought the Flying Machine was going to do more work on those Royal Hogs. Despite the really rough start, they're actually not in the worst position. Well, I mean, that tower on the right-hand side down to 541, but let's remember, Andrew, that we are now just 24 seconds away from double, elixir over to from double Elixir time, and that could end up being a really challenging spot here for Allegiance. Yeah, and you know Dignitas is really going to utilize that double Elixir time to get a double Lava Hound push because on this one Princess Tower, while they still have the damage lead, while they still have the tower lead, as soon as they can afford it, they're going to try to get that big push. So we are now entering that double elixir time. What do Wonka and Max Lemanas have in store? A split hog push here. With that tower down slow, so low on the right-hand side, Andrew, do you think that is the right play? Yeah, I think so. They need to start focusing on the left-hand tower. This is definitely going to be a two-tower game. Dignitas knows that they're just going to ignore the Valkyrie, which I think is the correct move. They're probably going to try to start a double Lava Hound push once they can defend against these uh, Royal Hogs. Well, there's a little misplay with a fireball as well from Wonka and Max Lemanas. Uh, gets picked up nicely with the, the Baby Dragon, but they did not get all four hogs with that one. Yeah, they they didn't, and it, it, it's not the worst misplay, but I, I couldn't agree more with the fact that like these spells are very important, and every single time they're, they're used and not utilized to their max capabilities, it, it's giving the other team an advantage to come back in the game. We are going into sudden death overtime, and what looked like it was going to be a blowout game and a potential sweep here for Dignitas, now it's Lupanji and Wiko turning this thing around, and that's eight Royal Hogs. Can any of them get to that left-hand tower? Wow, very, very masterfully defended by Dignitas there. I thought it could have been games. That could have been it. Remember, the next tower to fall, that is going to be the story. And the right-hand tower now in very significant danger for Allegiance. We're getting spell cycled out, and now both towers within spell range. Oh, no. Fireball, it's, it's, poison on one side, and that's going to be it. Allegiance, Wiko, and Lupanji coming from behind. They were in a bad hole to open this thing up, but uh, they turned it around, and it kind of made me eat my words there. It looked to me like... Uh, like uh, Lupanji and, and, and Wiko did not have a way back into this game. Yeah, I, and that's one thing that I love so much about Sierra. And, and we're going back here to the missed fireballs. You can see that didn't really come back and bite them in the butt too much. They, they fought through it. Maybe a bit of an overcommitment by Dignitas here on the first push, recognizing that they missed the fireball, but there's still so much elixir to be had and so many cards to be played. And here's that final, final moment. They know there's a nail in their coffin when they see that poison come down. They know what's in hand. Really, really well played by Allegiance. What I was going to say is that what I love so much about CRL and 2v2 is that no matter what happens early on, you can always bounce back. These guys are the best in the world. No matter how far they are behind, we can never count them out. So game number three about to get underway. And this week so far has been a, a week of crazy finishes. Yeah. Those of you who were watching North America earlier this week, that, uh, that TSM energy match was nuts. And we are one game away from even crazier action.
Claro. Y un ex de deck, faut pas être y el Vanidrago, cuidado, cuando lo tira, porque tiene que hacer algo más. Sí, sí, sí. So, a reminder, sí. Tornado, the only ban card, and uh, the, the, opening of, the opening set here hanging in the balance, and it's been razor thin so far, Andrew. Yeah, with Tornado being the only ban, I'm really curious to see how the balloon is going to be utilized in Wonka's hand. So we are seeing some shifts away from the Golem meta. Uh, a lot of you who are watching should be excited to see what other creative options these teams come up with. Looks like Dignitas running uh, not the exact same deck, but a very similar deck this time around. Wiko and Lupanji. Very excited to see what they do with this here in game number three. Yeah, I really, really like their deck uh, c composition here, Rich. I'm really curious to see how it works. And having that double poison in there, you think it's going to do a lot of work against these flying machines and the lava pup packs. Uh, I, I think they may have matchup here, but we've, we've been shown many, many times before that matchup doesn't mean anything when it comes to CRL in 2v2. Well, a lot of people uh, have been talking about the, the how so many of these 2v2 matches end on spell damage, uh, not as much ending on uh, on player or on character damage, but there's an interesting thing here. The spell damage hasn't been as heavy on the front end for tower targeting as it has been on the back end, like it was often in the Asian action. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, however, Allegiance getting that rocket in early on the Inferno da Dragon and the Princess Tower does change this match by 700 damage. Not that the rocket does that much, but as you can see here, we're at 2,000 with Allegiance and we're at 1,300 with Wonka, and you know that Inferno Dragon uh, rocket did a big part of that. So Miner getting on the tower here for Allegiance, and now they're the ones out to an early lead. Question now, can Dignitas take a page out of their playbook and flip the script here as we enter double elixir time? This is the second time this match where Allegiance, or excuse me, Dignitas has double dropped flying machines in the same place, and each time they've been cleaned up with one poison. That's a really, really positive elixir trade for Allegiance, and they're probably very happy with that exchange. You know, we're talking about 2v2 communication, how important that is. Do you think that's a communication error? I, 100%, and as you can see, they're paying for it by having to switch lanes. They've been trying to go down the right lane, recognizing that they're probably going to lose the Princess Tower. They need to switch it up, and now we've got that double Lava Hound push coming down the left-hand lane. But you see uh, Allegiance's Wiko and Lupanji. They have a lot of plans in store for that push. Interesting, though, a little late on some of that stuff, and there's the giant snowball that has been so much wow. more effective here in 2v2. Uh, surprisingly, that balloon ended up going down. Great placement by the Magic Archer. I was trying to figure out exactly how it was still getting hit, but that Magic Archer saved that tower, even and though it's only got 100 health left. It looks like we are possibly going to get a tower trade here. The question is who can get their spells down quickly enough. The right hand tower down for Dignitas with only five seconds left. Hand what, can for they get a Dignitas. poison down or something? There we go. Will it tick enough? I don't think it will. That is it. Allegiance. Oh my gosh. Wow. Such a change from last week. It was Allegiance who lost by 11 HP in the 2v2 set. This time they win by just 20. And that's the way the winds can blow here at CRL. Unbelievable. You're sitting there and you're looking at this and you're thinking that balloon is behind the Lava Hound. It's going to get to the tower, but the Magic Archer is taking it down. Really great use of the Magic Archer there. Mega Minion picks up the Flying Machine, keeping everything alive. Only 119 health, I believe, left on that baby Princess Tower. And Team Dignitas cannot believe what just happened. That is such a wild finish. And again, that has to feel good for Lupanji and Wiko after being on the end of that, that slight miscalculation last time. Yes. Where they, they played a poison early that didn't get tower damage, were forced to play a log in the opposite lane, and then couldn't quite take it down. Here they're, they're, they get the victory with the complete opposite script. Yeah, I'm looking at Dignitas's hand after that first spell came out, and I was like, what do they have? What do they have? They don't have anything. And, and they just they didn't have it. They didn't have anything to do 100 damage. Wow. Congrats. Communication is key, playing in ahead so critical here in 2v2. And no less critical is the, the playing in ahead in 1v1, our next set on its way with two superstars about to go head to head. The 1v1 showdown is here, and this one could be an instant classic. Doberman's got the bark and the bite, but across the river, I am JP is the golden boy with the golden hair and golden play. Which of these CRL stars will emerge victorious? 
Very interesting note here, Andrew, for these two players. Doberman, after going 0-3 and, and 2v2, gets moved to 1v1. So far, undefeated, not just in sets, but in games. Yes, absolutely. Doberman is 2-0 and in 1v1 sets. And then on the other side, IMJP, however, is 2-2 two two in 1v1 sets, but 5-0 and in King of the Hills. So you know his head-to-head -head capabilities are nothing to be seen lightly. Now let's take a look at these bands. Royal Hogs, not a big surprise there, but I think this is the first time we're seeing Pekka Band in our 1v1 sets. We've seen how powerful that one, or that Pekka Bridge Spam deck is when played patiently. It just has so many defenses, re defensive responses, and then on the other side of that, great counter push capability. Another question possibly, might Doberman be looking at a giant deck, which we've seen more in the meta since the Prince got buffed? I mean, there's really only one way to find out, Rich, and I think that's by hopping into our 1v1 set. <laughs> So a lot of questions about to be answered here for both teams. IMJP at the top of your screen, Doberman at the bottom. And the real question being, can IMJP take that King of the Hill magic and start applying it to his 1v1 game? Yeah, you look here at IMJP's player card, and he's got like nine different decks that he's ran, whereas on the other side, you look at Doberman, and he's been he's found great success with that Mega Knight minor control deck. And as you can see, he's already opened up with another minor. Very possible we're seeing a, a variation of that deck one more time. And a Tombstone played for IMJP, taking it slow to open up. Yeah, we've seen the Tombstone pop in Graveyard decks, Three Musketeers decks with the Hog. It's, 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 it's so great right now in the meta. It's such a great defensive response. So far looking like Doberman going back to what works, of course. Uh, he is 2-0 and o with that Mega Knight Minor Control deck. And I was just going to say, I believe IMJP is running a Lava Loon deck. Usually when you see guards with the Tombstone, that's, that's basically what it means 90% of the time. So looking at this right now, Andrew, Lava Loon, of course, uh, such a frustrating deck to deal with. Between the Inferno Dragon, the, the Minions, the Electro Wizard, do you think that as we go further through this game, he has the answer? Maybe not for this balloon right here, though. Oh, my gosh. And really great use of the Zap there by IMJP, perfectly resetting that Inferno Dragon, and that balloon is going to take that tower. I was going to ask you, with all those different cards in his hand, does he have the answer for this deck? And then right as I'm asking that, the balloon slides on through. Do you think maybe it was just that Doberman had com uh, committed a little bit too far to the right-hand side? Uh, I, it's not in entirely that. It's just that he didn't have the greatest responses to stop that Lava Hound and Balloon push. I mean, he did have the Inferno Dragon in hand, and maybe playing the... I, I thought IMGP playing the Mega Minion on the right side to defend was a misplay, but he still had the Elixir to, to support the Balloon with the Zap. Just great plays by both these guys. Look, and it might be that Doberman knows his game plan here because obviously he is significantly ahead. Not only have they each taken one tower down, but he has good damage on the left-hand Princess Tower and huge damage almost halfway down the King Tower of IMJP. Yeah, but you got to think that last card with IMJP is probably going to be... I'd say either a lightning or a fireball. So I'm just curious to see exactly how Doberman's going to stop these next big uh, Lava Loon pushes. So double Inferno to... Dragon in the middle here. What do you think about Double Inferno Dragon here? Is, is it a little bit too aggressive? I think that was a little too aggressive. I don't know why he supported it. I mean, I get it, but he, IMJP can completely ignore it and support his push down here on the right. And the fireball taking out the pair of E-Wizzes and the question is, will we get a drop? And yes, we do. We do get a significant drop. And now that right-hand tower in very, very severe danger as we move into Southern Death Overtime. And you at home may have not caught, but IMGP doing a great job of zapping not only the Princess, but the King Tower to reset, get a little bit more damage. And now he is in the driver's seat. He knows he is so close to being in spell cycle range. Doberman probably really regretting that Inferno Dragon that he played right up in the pocket. And again, this is what CRL is all about. Doberman took that lead, had so much damage on the King Tower and the left Princess Tower, and now it is Hay who is on his back foot just trying to stay alive here in these waning seconds. Yeah, and you saw him even just leak one elixir right there, probably trying to figure out, what do I do? How do I win? Can I win quick enough? But he just no, did not he cannot. have the fireball the is in, and I am JP. Uh, continuing to show why he is so dangerous in head-to-head. -head. Yeah, you see these just really, really minor plays that make such a big difference. The fireball cleaning all of that up, the zap coming in on the king and the princess tower, all of these things make massive differences. And on the other side of that, if you're Doberman, you need to spread out your troops more. Do not put your Electro Wizard right next to your minions or vice versa because the one spell cleaning all that up makes your defense useless. So Andrew, it did feel like Doberman had a lot of answers in 
in that deck to to Lava Loom, which is of course a very frustrating deck to play against. Yeah. So do you think it was it was a, a mixture of troop placement and aggression? What lost him the game there? I mean, having a lot of air dis, uh, defense was not in his hand, but he did make a few misplays in there that separated, uh, made the gap much bigger. Well, one game down, another game on its way. Can I am JP continue this thing? and send his squad to King of the Hill, or will Doberman tie it up here in 1v1? Ice Golem in the back for Doberman. I am JP now switching it up, going with Miner on the tower. Really, really cheap cycle so far we see for Doberman. Could it be Siege? And even cheaper, I mean, look at that now. Just a seven elixir cycle for Doberman. So what is he trying to get down quickly? And now this makes me start to feel like it's some sort of maybe a Hog Rider deck. Hog Rider could be Giant. We've seen Giant coupled with Hunter a lot, but those troops supporting it don't make tons of sense. Well, with Pekka banned, so there we see the three Musketeers, so probably going to see a Hog Rider to pair with that. Very nice pickup, though, from IMJP. Yeah, great Fireball Zap. Not what Doberman wanted to see in his opponent's hand. So I was going to say is with the P.E.K.K.A. ban, that does give some more value not only to a Hog Rider, but also to potentially, you know, would you, but it might it be that we're seeing Poison and Giant as the last two cards for IMJP. A distinctive possibility, and there's the Giant. We've seen that paired a little bit more there's lately with hog. that Prince buff. There we go. So these guys clearly knowing what each other are playing, going to keep doing this. They're just going to keep pushing the opposite lane, plays best defenses they can, and keep the pressure up. You know, with the fireball in the hand, probably not likely to see a second big spell, so uh, good, good call on IMJP not to go with that. You know, you see the miner and you see the giant together. Sometimes you think we're going towards that poison, that goison deck, as you right, called it right. before. Yeah, but, and I love the synergy between the miner and the giant. It just makes the miner so much more powerful. And then the miner tanking for the prince, wow, that is not how Doberman wanted that exchange to go. Andrew, you and I were talking before before uh, the show today about how frustrated I've been with my, my favorite Expo deck because the Prince buff not only means one more card that's hard to deal with for an Expo, but also means there's more Giants showing up now yeah, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and also, it's, it makes it a little harder to gauge decks immediately. Like, I was watching uh, a few pro players streaming recently, and, you know, they don't always predict the Prince now because he's been out of the meta for a minute. It's not that they forget about him, but wow. That's a huge fireball, fireball from IMJP. He still has to defend on the right-hand side. Uh, the Musketeer's getting taken care of, but looks like, unless he can handle this hog very quickly, we're in a tower trade situation late in the game. Yeah, and it looks like it is going to be exactly that. It's 74 HP, you know, close enough. Get it out of the way with the log. Interesting to see what, how they're going to change, though, the second half of this match. I definitely feel IMJP has the matchup advantage. Doberman has a very quick cycle, but now he is on his back foot. Another giant prince coming down the right-hand lane. His, his King Tower also in significant trouble. Looking like IMJP gearing up for the sweep here in 1v1. Yeah, that is not where you want your King Tower as a Hog Rider player, because now IMJP has the luxury of pushing essentially wherever he wants, and you have to defend so, so intensely. And with the Hog Rider kind of wow. kind of crippled in this point, not going to be able to get, across, get, get that down, you have to defend so intently. This is going to be it. We are now within easy spell range. The Miner taking it down, and IMJP showing up in 1v1. The Golden Boy does it one more time, sends his team to King of the Hill, and he has to be feeling confident going into his current undefeated set. Yeah, you heard him before the match. He's not scared of anybody, and you just look at these replays, the type of plays that IMJP continues to make, getting excellent spell, spell value, knowing when to push, knowing when to defend, and then when you, if we, I don't think we're gonna show the very end of the match here, but when at the very end of the match, when he played the Giant in the pocket with the Mega Minion on top of it, he knew that Doberman's best response was a Hunter, and Hunters are very, very squishy, so, Wow, IMJP taking Team Dignitas into his favorite place, King of the Hill. Really great play. Now, Andrew, one thing that we saw happen in, in both the opening game of this 1v1 set and the closing game of this, sorry, second game and closing game of this 1v1 set was some real clumping by Doberman of his troops. A lot of spell value there. How might, what, what kind of adjustments would you make in that situation? I mean, sometimes you can't help it, right? Sometimes you need to either just defend as much as you can in one spot or your troops are going to work their way together as they come down the map. But I think 
throughout the match, when I watched some of his troop placement, he could have been a little bit more cautious with spreading them out. And I think it really would have saved him with a lot of that spell value that IMJP kept getting. He capitalized on almost every single one of them, and you saw how powerful that was. Well, we are in a set now where each team can spread out the pressure. It is King of the Hill. Each team will nominate three players. Each player gets just one life, and the first team to eliminate all three players from the other squad takes the set and takes the match, and we're going to have to figure out what are their lineups, what are their card bands. This is one of the most critical parts of strategy as we get late in the match. Let's find out what they're thinking when we go inside the war rooms. Uh, King of the Hill, les bands, c'est Princess et Royal Hogs. Uh, leur lineup en face, Juanca, Max et JP. Donc on s'est mis d'accord. On en a parlé, on aligne Samir en premier, Anis en deuxième, et Zach en trois. Donc notre ban du coup on a dit princesse. Je sais pas l'écrire, c'est pas grave. On se met pas la pression. Hein euh, on sait très bien de quoi on est capable, on peut le faire. On pas de pression sur qui que ce soit, on joue comme on joue, on sait tous très bien jouer donc on peut le faire et euh, surtout voilà bah faut qu'on parte sans avoir de regrets. Maintenant on est au King of the Hill, il y a de quoi il y a de quoi faire. Donc pas de pression, chacun sait ce qu'il fait, chacun sait ce qu'il vaut et puis euh, on va le faire. Moi j'ai confiance en vous les gars. Mais gueule. Right boys, King of the Hill, Princess Rohogs band. We prepared. Going first. We've got Jaunka. <laughs> going second, Max, it's you mate. And going third, we've got IMOP. Don't know what that M is. <laughs> Boys, we've been here three times, we've won it three times. We know how it goes. We should make this number four, yeah? Yeah. Let's go. Let's three. go. One, two, two three. three. Big, Big win. win! Team Dignitas has only one loss. Allegiance badly needs a win. The question is, who wants it more? Seriously, guys, I'm asking, never mind. Let's settle it in the arena with King of the Hill. King of the Hill on its way, and no big surprises here in the lineups. Both squads kind of sticking to what they've felt comfortable with so far in our third set. Yeah, we got Donkey Kong leading off for Allegiance. Lupanji in that second spot. And Doberman, of course, leading up the back end. And on the other side for Dignitas, we got Wanthka coming off, trying to get his very first King of the Hill win. Max Lemanas in the middle. And, of course, their closer, IMJP, in that last spot. Look at these card bands, Andrew. No surprise, Dignitas getting Royal Hogs off the board worked so well for IMJP a moment ago. Princess making maybe her second or third appearance on our ban list. Yeah, she, we've seen how powerful she can be in that new log bait deck with the princess, the rascals, and the prince. We've also seen her be very effective in that hog rider mini P.E.K.K.A. deck, so maybe it's just something they don't want to have to deal with. First to three wins King of the Hill and wins the match. Let's go. It's Dignitas Wonka at the top of your screen. Allegiance Donkey Kong at the bottom. Interesting matchup here, Andrew, with Donkey Kong undefeated at 2-0 in King of the Hill. Wonka still looking for his first victory in this set. Yeah, definitely a thing that you want to get under your belt. Always getting that first win is going to make you feel so much more confident playing throughout the rest of the season. Interesting note that, uh, that Wonka tends to like both cycle and bait decks primarily. Not a big beatdown player. We see him kind of showing a bit of a cycle here. Maybe we're thinking that Princess Ban, you're talking about it getting rid of some bait, and maybe they're thinking, hey, let's get let's get the first player off the board as fast as possible. Yeah, and also the Princess and those bait decks really succeed against beatdown style decks because you're never really able, your opponent's never really able to build up the elixir that they want. The Valkyrie in the lineup for Donkey Kong, still a very powerful card, not quite as powerful as she was about two weeks ago after the slight changes. Remember now her attack speed down from 1.4 seconds oh, wow. to 1.6 seconds per swing. That great use of the fireball to get rid of that tombstone, able to get the lumberjack on the tower. You never, ever want a lumberjack to get on your tower. He does so much damage so quickly. It's so frustrating when he gets through defensively. Offensively, you kind of always feel like you got a gift there. Yeah, oh, totally. So the Inferno Dragon making its way across the river. The support not there in time to, uh, to do a whole lot for it, but the Valkyrie will get chewed up. We are now at the midway point, and it's the graveyard deck coming down for Donkey Kong. 
you figure it's got to be Graveyard when you see the Ice Wizard, you see the Valkyrie, you see the Mega Minion. These are all great units to tank for that Graveyard. However, Wonka using that Lumberjack to clean up those skeletons very effectively. Lumberjack, a great response. Also two very inexpensive responses in the Minions and the Guards. Yeah, and, and, and you got to feel like Donkey Kong has the matchup advantage here because he's got Tornado, because he's got Tombstone. Whereas Wonka, on the other side, guards are great to clean up, so are minions, but those are both units that are going to get cleaned up by poison. So unless Wonka just outplays Donkey Kong here, Donkey Kong should take this match. Now, interesting question here, Andrew, because the, 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 the big question being, can Donkey Kong get a full tower drop with this combination? Or is he simply looking to get a couple hundred hits every single time and maybe just play strong defense as we go into our sudden death overtime? I mean, that's the beauty of Graveyard, right? Sometimes you can just send it all by itself and just hope you even just do 200 damage. Whereas also, there's going to be that push where you're just going to kill their whole entire tower. And as I said before, you can drop guards, you can drop minions, but they're going to get cleaned up and your Valkyrie's going to get to the tower. Wonka threw up a bunch of crying faces. He knows this is a really horrible matchup. That, was, that was a big hit there. You know, uh, we talked some about the idea that some coaches are playing to the lowest tower when they get to King of the Hill. Looking like it's not going to happen here. As we enter Sudden Death Overtime, both players now under 1,000 hit points. And now we're, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Just naked graveyards, poison on top, hope a skeleton gets in. If it does or doesn't, you've only got to do one less poison, and that's exactly what's that's happening That's going to be now. it right there. Donkey Kong continues the unbeaten streak in King of the Hill. Wonka still not finding his way into the win column. So you have one player down now for, for Team Dignitas. Two more coming on their way. Next up in front of Donkey Kong is Max Lemonas. Yes, absolutely. You got Max Lemonas coming in, trying to save it for his team. But of course, they've still got IMJP on the back end to bring it home just in case. Two more wins, all they need. Can Allegiance pull this thing out right now? Game number two on its way. Donkey Kong still unbeaten in King of the Hill. Can he continue that streak here against Max Lemonas? Yeah, and you got to think he's got to feel pretty confident with another spell in his hand to just send in the minor like that as his very first play. Well, Donkey Kong has been playing, has had some success in the past with that P.E.K.K.A. minor control we've seen here at CRL. Max Lemonas, uh, in his last King of the Hill appearance, played three Musketeers, did not get the victory, so it looks like he might be switching things up here a little bit. Yeah, it looks like we might be seeing that minor giant poison deck here coming from Max Lemonas. And then on the other side of that, Donkey Kong running an interesting, looks already like some sort of cheap log bait deck, but there's no princess. But as you can see, he's got the Dark Goblin, he's got the Tombstone, and he's got the Goblin Gang, all of those loggable. So there's a question, was there a bit of gamesmanship by banning the princess so that you might get the log out of people's hands and then play a deck with all the loggable cards. That you know what? That's totally, dude. That's that's a great analysis. So the poison down on the right hand side, the Inferno Dragon, not gonna get really anything on that right hand tower, but still down to 1594. Donkey Kong out to another good start. Interesting, you never really see Miner in any of those log decks. I was thinking maybe you could replace the Princess with a Magic Archer in that instance, but here we see we have a Rascal's. So it's kind of like a Rascal's Miner Poison Control with a bait aspect to it. So with no log, it's gonna be a lot more difficult to take care of all these small troops. Yes, you have the Zap, not a good of a response, the Poison a little bit more expensive. So it's going to be interesting to see how Donkey Kong can take advantage here. Well, see, all of Donkey Kong's troops are poison, are weak to poison, including the Rascals. And then you think about the Rascals as the strongest tank for him. That going head to head with a prince is not a good place to be in. So interesting question here, Andrew. What one difference we do see is the speed of these decks, right? Donkey Kong, the most expensive troop being his Rascal. Of course, you have uh, two troops at five over across from Max Lemonas. So do you think that that's gonna be a big part of this Donkey Kong trying to beat him to the punch? Yeah, it's gonna help, he's gonna try to outcycle him, he's gonna try to uh, push opposite lane, although he's done so much damage to this right tower, it's kinda hard not to. Uh, I just think he's gonna have a really difficult time defending with that poison in Max Lemonas' hand. Interesting note, they both have the same fastest cycle at 11, so trying to outcycle gonna be challenging, but I guess part of that is that he's hoping to have more elixir in his back pocket when those moments come up. Yeah, and, and, and it's really right now, it's an interesting like minor 
poison battle here between the two of them. Uh, both towers so close, but wow, Donkey Kong really taking a big uh, damage advantage right now. Well, one thing we've talked about here before is that slight advantage that the Miner gives when you can get on the tower. And of course, Donkey uh, uh, Max Lemonas has not been putting the Miner on the tower wow. quite as much. And here you go, Donkey Kong, one more time. 4-0 and oh in King of the Hill. Donkey Kong continuing to show off his skills here in the third and final set. <clears throat> yeah, I understand what Max was going for with that deck but uh, Donkey Kong really just using this, this very interesting deck that he created, kind of picking it apart. Those Swarm Troops doing so much damage, he did a wonderful job of spreading everything out so that it wouldn't get all cleaned up by the poison. Dropping the Rascals up front, dropping the Dark Goblin in the middle, Goblin Gain in the back, just really, really heads up play. I really want to know, because Allegiance did ban the Princess. I want to know if that Princess ban was to set up that deck potentially. I, I think so, because looking at that deck, like I said, it has really got a lot of log bait aspects to it, and the Poison was helping clean it up, but not having a two, uh, two elixir card that just cleans everything up, that cycles really quickly, I, I think that's exactly what they were going for. Well, Donkey Kong one game away from the sweep, but he's coming up against the man who is undefeated in King of the Hill. It's I Am JP. Two top players, both undefeated in King of the Hill. One of them will leave with a blemish on his record today, Andrew. Yeah, and they're both given the good luck. This is going to be a big one. Battle of the heavyweights. I am JP, top of your screen. Allegiance's Donkey Kong at the bottom. And again, we've seen the versatility of I am JP, but Donkey Kong today showing off that he too can mix it up pretty well. Yep. These guys, I mean, that's really, here at Sierra, you have to be able to play all types of different decks with that band being in effect, being in play. You never want your archetype that you're good at to just be out of play. So another deck I don't think we've seen from IMJP yet. Royal Hogs are banned. It might be that Hog Rider there, and we're doing that variation of the Three Musketeers Hog Rider deck. Yeah, uh, Donkey Kong may be wishing that he could get that poison back, but we'll see how he defends right now. Holding on to his elixir right now and puts the Valkyrie with the skeleton supporting right on those two. A nice pickup, and yes, there you go. There's the classic Hog Rider sneaking through for IMJP. But a nice tornado to activate that King Tower. Yeah, we've got a Hog Three Musketeers here going up against a graveyard deck. Uh, with the Tombstone in hand, you'd feel like Donkey Kong has the inherent advantage here, matchup, but IMJP has proven that really nothing can stop him in King of the Hill, whether it's matchup, whether it's play, anything, he can always battle through it. When you're looking at IMJP's deck, Andrew, what do you think he's going to use in response when that graveyard comes out? <sighs> That's a good question. I mean, with the skeletons and the bats being his cycle cards that are so cheap, both of them very effective at killing those little skeletons that come with the graveyard. However, poison being on play for Donkey Kong makes those units basically useless. Both of them not only poisonable, of course, you know, want to see if Donkey Kong's saving the poison uh, to specifically use on, on the Three Musketeers. But you have a cheaper option with uh, with that tornado potentially pulling them away from a graveyard push. And the tornado kills them. Tornado kills the skeletons and the bats. So he's really got great answers to IMJP's responses to his win condition. And with Tombstone and Valkyrie in play, we know that that stops these hog riders very, very effectively. Although right now it is IMJP out to the slight lead here as we are in double elixir time. So the question here is, can the golden-haired golden boy do it once more? and clutch this thing for Dignitas. Yeah, great job of stopping the Valkyrie at the river so it can't tank for those skeletons, but the skeleton's still getting a decent amount of damage in. And like I said, I just can't imagine uh, that IMJP doesn't have an inherent match disadvantage. But the Hunter there, a very interesting choice as the cleanup, and notice how he positioned it just on the edge of the graveyard only allowing a couple hundred hit points of damage. Yeah, the splash damage from the Hunter, really great. And also the fact that IMJP knew that nothing was tanking for that Princess Tower, so he had the Hunter and the Tower shooting at those skeletons. So now the poison on the right-hand side. Interesting wrinkle here, Andrew, leaving those two Musketeers in pretty strong condition on the left-hand side as a Hog Rider comes down the right lane at the exact same time. And we've seen that misplay come out where you get a little, advanced, or a little aggressive, a little overzealous, and you lose your poison when you need it most for defense. However, Donkey Kong's still doing a great job of cleaning that up. The Hunter has been the answer so far for Donkey Kong, and now the Ice Golem. You know, another thing that you might forget about, the Ice Golem can pick up a lot of those skeletons, and when it dies, Kaboom, there they go. Yeah, and, and this is another thing that we've we've discussed a little bit here is that great tornado Look at that there. tornado, uh -huh. Andrew. And now the poison's going to come down completely, completely deeming those ineffective. What I was going to say, though, is that we've seen how 
uh, important matchup really is in 1v1. It's not the same as in 2v2, whereas 2v2, it matters a decent amount, maybe like 25 and 75, whereas matchup in 1v1 can be a 60% advantage. And here we go again. It's the graveyard. It's now we're in a tower race. Who can finish this thing off? Uh, Great but, but the hunter is still holding strong in very dangerous position. Will it go down? Yes, it will. Yes. Wow. And that is it. Donkey Kong the completes sweep. the sweep in King of the Hill. You know, it looked like IMJP might have magic up his sleeve one more time. He was playing that about as well as anyone yeah. could in that situation, but just could not overcome the graveyard deck of one of the best players out of the entire country of France. Yeah, great tornado here to activate the King Tower and using the Mega Minion to clean up the Musketeer, uh, mitigating almost all the damage. And then as we can see at the end, the Skeletons, the Ice Wizard, the Valkyrie, just too much for IMJP to deal with. And as I was rambling on, it was really <laughs> about exactly what we're talking about, the inherent matchup advantage being so, so powerful here. IMJP nearly taking that thing, but it was Donkey Kong, the victor today, not making his appearance in 1v1, being brought in as a, two, as a King of the Hill specialist. And right now you can see pretty strong coaching decision because he is now undefeated at 5-0 in our third and final set. Yeah, there's some players out there that under pressure they fold. They don't want to be the closer. They don't want to be in King of the Hill. They just want to be in the set that they're comfortable with. And then there's other people like Donkey Kong, like IMJP, who really, really excel when the pressure is on today. Honestly, the matchup just wasn't in IMJP's hand. More pressure, no problems for Allegiance. Donkey Kong again going 3-0 and oh with the sweep in King of the Hill. And he is standing by right now with our colleague Christy St. John. Thanks, guys. JP was on a roll until he ran into the barrel of Donkey Kong, dethroning him. How is it feeling? Yeah, my heart, my heart is still pounding. I have... Uh... <laughs> I, I felt a lot of pressure, but I uh, prepared my match very well. I knew exactly what kind of decks every uh, one of them was playing, so I took uh, the best one to counter them. Really? So you predicted all those matchups? It seems like you had all those hard counters in hand. Yeah, uh, when I saw their decks, I knew exactly, oh yeah, I was thinking about that, and that's the, the, the right call. <laughs> you got it. Great calls, great game, man. Back to you guys. Thanks, Christy. Unbelievable performance from Donkey Kong. Not just fantastic play, but that mental game preparation coming in. You know, I, I really want to ask him about that princess, if yeah. that was a setup to, to create that bait deck. And, I, you know, seeing what he did there and what he just talked about, you kind of feel like it might be, but it doesn't matter. Donkey Kong, three wins in a row, and giving Allegiance one more victory here in the European region. Yeah, not a lot of things shifting around as we get into our standings. As you can see, Dignitas still in that second place position, not moving, but they are taking a loss. So now they're tied actually for second with G2, which also means Allegiance and SK Gaming are also tied technically for third since Dignitas and G Sports are tied for second. Crazy, crazy things happening with that win and loss. Everything is so close here in the EU. A very big chance to secure that second place position. And with our next match coming, you really kind of, as, as that team wish you had done it because coming up next, it's Misfits searching for their very first win against one of the most dangerous teams here with a chance to shoot right up the standings in Team Liquid. Ha ha, the best part of the CRL. We've always got time for a double header. In our second match, the always intimidating Team Liquid takes on last place Misfits Gaming, desperate for a win. Will Global Star Surgical Goblin impose his will? Or can that one guy finally deliver that one CRL win? It's time to find out! If one match wasn't enough, well, guess what? Here at CRL, we always have a second one in store. And this one, critical for both teams playing. You have Misfits searching for their first win against a Team Liquid trying to live up to a deservedly high reputation. Absolutely, yeah. As you said, Misfits are 0-5 right now, but this is a great position to be in because if you take that first win over Team Liquid, that is an emphatic victory. And then, of course, Team Liquid, the most famous team in the world, bringing in a new player today. Let's see if Buff Mac wakes his way into the lineup. And, of course, we know Azili's Surgical and Diego B trying to still figure out their 2v2 and 1v1 lineups. The Brit could make his debut today for Team Liquid. Of course, you have three of the best players in the world yes. as his teammates. And one of them is standing by right now with Christy St. John as she has Surgical Goblin. 
Thanks, guys. Surgical Goblin. So you switch up your lineup every time to confuse your opponent. Of course, critics might say that it's just you're trying to figure out who's better in 2v2, who's better in 1v1. What do you think? I mean, what have you learned about your team by switching it up? Uh, well, of course, sometimes we notice that maybe, for example, uh, Asilis and Diego could have some communication problems. Uh, but usually we just try to switch it up, as you said, like to confuse our opponent and to yeah, be unpredictable. Unpredictable, got it. So Misfits still winless, mm -hmm. but they have some amazing players. Reggae's had some great success in the 2v2. Anything there that you see that worries you? Uh, yeah, even though they are 0-5, I don't think we should underestimate them. And we're definitely not doing that. We prepare it like this match, like any other match. I'm excited to see it. Yeah. Back to you guys. Thanks, Christy. We are moments away from both these teams taking a big step, hopefully in the correct direction. Of course, only one of them will be going up. One of them will be uh, leaving the day without that victory in hand. And a big part of that is deciding your matchups, 2v2, 1v1, your card bans, all those choices coming your way right now inside the war rooms. Hey, boys. Uh, What's up? What's up? Okay, for today's matches, we are ready for the 2 vs 2 and for the 1 vs 1. Today, Frank and me are going to do the 2 vs 2 and Diego the 1 vs 1. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and even though they are 0 5, I don't think we should underestimate them, especially in this format. Mm -hmm. So we just prepared like we do for any other team and let's do this. Yeah, liquid yeah for death. sure. Or let's go Liquid at 3. All right. 1, and 2, two three. 3. Let's, let's go, go liquid. liquid! Okay, guys. For today, like Manu said, we need to be confident and play relaxed. Okay, we have a giant in front of us, but I don't care. You only came here, play, and do what you want. And what you like to do, but be confident. And that's all for today. Only play, relaxed, and all done. They've spoken their deepest secrets behind glass walls, but now it's time to shatter their opponents. Glass, shatter, see what I did there? Anyway, Misfits and Liquid, it's time for a 2v2 throwdown in the arena. Well played, King, well played indeed. We did see what you did there, and now we're about to see some good play from these squads, 2v2, Pepe and Reggae coming on out. Yeah, Pepe and Reggae have had good ex uh, experience playing with one another, and as we've realized here in 2v2, communication and teamwork is so, so important. And of course, Azili's and Surgical coming out for Team Liquid, that is exactly what they're trying to focus on. Surge is the best communicator on Team Liquid, whether it's a language barrier thing or whether it's because he calls the shots in 2v2, we'll leave it up to them, but he is gonna lock down this 2v2 duo. And of course, a set of card bans active for all potential three games here in 2v2. Tornado, no surprise there. Fireball recently taking the place of Poison a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, we've seen how powerful Royal Hogs are. I, we haven't seen much of Three Musketeers in 2v2, but that Fireball for the Royal Hogs, for the Lava Pups, for the Balloon, so, so powerful. And of course, the Tornado cannot bring things to the King Tower as easily. It's just nice to have it off the table. Will they find their proper matchup? Can Team Liquid make it happen? Or will it be Misfits right here, right now? I guess I Team Liquid, Surgical, Goblin, and Azili's at the top of your screen. At the bottom, Misfits, Reggae, and Pepe. And as you mentioned before, Andrew, it looks like Surgical Goblin is going to be the 2v2 specialist for Team Liquid. Yeah, and immediately you see Team Liquid taking advantage of the fact that that Fireball's off the table. Both of them running Flying Machines, a really, really great card when you don't have Fireball in your opponent's hand. And it looks like not just that, but Misfits choosing to go with the Flying Machine and the Magic Archer, both easily fireballed, traded out cards. Now a little bit more safe on the board with that card in the hole. Yeah, Liquid will definitely be using their poisons for that, but they'll be probably using it a little bit more cautiously or conservatively than they would the fireball because you want to make sure your poison's getting a little bit more value in my personal opinion. So we have a Lava Hound versus a Golem push right now. The Golems, though, because of the Golemites, getting a little bit more damage on that tower. Yeah, I'm a little surprised that we're not seeing an Inferno Dragon. Oh, there it is. It's in uh, Azili's hand. Maybe it was just out of cycle. Now the Flying Machine stopping the Valkyrie in its track. Same thing for the Inferno Dragon. So for just a few Elixir, the Flying Machine doing so much work. Yeah, and I had the pleasure of talking with 
team uh, misfits before the match and, and talking to them about how they're really keeping a level head throughout this and trying to keep their confidence up, recognizing it's still early in the season. When they have those rough matches, they like to take a little bit of time away from the game and remember why they're on a team together, enjoy each other's company, and really build their teamwork. Well, might I suggest some One Tree Hill, or if that's not your flavor, maybe a little <laughs> Dawson's Creek to go older. Some way to clear your head. We've seen it work for other teams in North America, but right now we are in the European region and reaching double elixir time. It is or was Team Liquid with a slight lead until that Lightning and those Golemites. Yeah, really, really close match right now. Both these teams playing very well, playing two different styles of beatdown, but really taking advantage of their opponent's mistakes and also just getting great spell value throughout. So far, Reggae and Pepe, though, playing fairly clean in a high-pressure situation. You know, 0-5 up against two of the world's best. So very well holding their own at this juncture. Yeah, yeah, and, and you got to imagine that that pressure is definitely being felt by Misfits. Being 0-5 is tough, but that also means that they're our hungriest team here in the EU. They need that win more than anyone else, and they know one over Team Liquid would be huge for them. We'll talk about pressure. Team Liquid, of course, made of some of the best players in the world, and more importantly, some of the best known players in the world. And they, they, you know, they spoke a little bit about trying to live up to the reputations that they have that, of course, are deservedly high reputations, but uh, you know the pressures of dealing with that, especially on the, the, the kind of different style competition and st big stage here at CRA. Wow, great defense there by Team Liquid, really being nothing. able to clean up what looked like a push that was going to end the game. However, that flying machine getting on the tower, that's going to do it. Wow, and there we go. It's Reggae and Pepe taking the first game of 2v2. You know, bringing Surgical Goblin into 2v2, uh, definitely a calculated move both for his, uh, his communication skills, but also for the fact that you have one of the best players in the world competing in the lead-off set. But here it is, Reggae and Pepe now taking the game win and putting themselves in a pretty nice position to open this thing up. Absolutely, the confidence boost there of taking the first game in this set, especially against who they took it from, is got to be great for them. And, and honestly, they just played a really, really great match straight up. There was no mistakes really made by either team. Obviously, looking back with the loss, you can always, you know, hindsight is 2020. However, it seemed pretty even across the board. Misfits just really outplaying Team Liquid in that very first game. Golem Balloon doing its damage here. Can they do it again in game number two? Game number two on its way. Interesting note here, Andrew. This is now uh, a quite a bit of a run of struggle for Surgical Goblin in the 2v2 set. We uh, recently saw him lose to Morton and Mithja of SK in 2v2. The, the double log bait deck not working and the double rail hog deck falling to it falling to that team. Yeah, really, really big win for SK. You, you remember them celebrating after that match. It was great for them, but you even saw a win there doesn't mean a win everywhere else. And so that's what is so great about CRL is two times you're playing every single team. So the Lightning taking out a lot of that support here early on in game number two. You know, seeing, seeing a sort of looks like Surgical and Azili's taking a page out of their opponent's book here at the goal. Yeah, absolutely. But if you look at the actual the elixir values right now, it appears that even though they've done, actually, no, Team Liquid's even done more damage. So them really in the driver's seat right now with a, a better starting push. And the Princess Tower chewing up those support troops. Sorry, Andrew. But now interesting development here. The P.E.K.K.A. coming out in response to the Golem. Yeah, great response to the Golem. However, the Prince being able to poke that ja Javelin. Is that what they're called? Sure, a Javelin would work. <laughs> a Lance. A Lance. I, I can never remember. Being able to poke it around, that Golem is going to help with that P.E.K.K.A. cleaning it up. Uh, the Golem not going to make it to the tower, but that P.E.K.K.A. also going down means a uh, pretty decent elixir trade for them. So got to distract that Prince, the Magic Archer, doing a good job in support, cleaning that up so far, despite being uh, behind at this juncture as we approach double elixir time. Still some pretty solid defensive choices from Pepe and Reggae. A little cleaning up of some of that bat support with the giant snowball. My favorite things about being here at CRL is being able to hear these teams communicating with one another, just nonstop back and forth. And other teams are a lot more uh, conservative in the communication with one another, almost trying to, like, the, the, like they've mind melded. Well, you and I, Andrew, have played some 2v2 together here amongst the crew at CRL. 
And uh, first, just want to say that uh, as a 2v2 pair, you and I are undefeated. We are. We, we have absolutely not are. <laughs> we, we have not gone up against the, uh, the, the biggest names in the game so far. But you and I have, have spent a lot of time communicating and really making sure we know where each other's pages are. And right now, the communication of Goblin and Azili's Surgical now about to take this left-hand yeah. tower. And looks like that should be game number two in Team Liquid's book. 20 seconds left. I don't think Misfits has a chance of getting that left-hand tower. Down. No, and that was really a great lead-up because I honestly believe the reason the Misfits lost this game specifically was because of miscommunications. Uh, their defense was just never quite as sound as it was in the very first game. They spent a little Little more elixir defending than they needed to throughout the entire match and team liquid being the pros that they are just took advantage of it and a really nice pickup there you know we've seen time and time again that balloon can sneak through at the very end but putting the tombstone down using the spells to stop it in its tracks a little bit of slow a little bit of knockback fantastic work from surgical goblin and azilis and we're looking at this replay here you see he's got the lumberjack the prince and the Golemites going all to the tower. Just a little bit too much for Team Misfits to stop. And that is it. Just one more hit from the E-Wiz takes that tower out. And now we are heading to game number three. Looking here, not as much building work done by Team Liquid, but one all-important building spent. Three Elixir on that final tombstone, making sure they don't lose the game and therefore the set in the last couple of seconds. Yeah, and talking about the sets, both of these teams really emphasizing in pre-match how important it is to take this very first set. Game number three on its way. Will it be Misfits with a 2v2 upset, or will Team Liquid shut this thing down? Yes, let's go. And one more time, Liquid at the top of your screen, Misfits at the bottom, your band cards, Tornado and Fireball. This is a huge, huge game, maybe the most important game in this entire match. And we've seen that before, of course, uh, in that really tough loss Allegiance had against Team Queso, the, the, 11, the 11 HP tower match, yeah. where, where that one game changed the entire fate. They, they could have swept Team Queso, instead went to King of the Hill where they lost, keeping Team Queso at a perfect record. So we've seen how much 2v2 can really affect the entire tenor of this head-to-head -head, of the head-to-head -head sets. Yeah, and the, and the places where players are most comfortable in 1v1 and in King of the Hill, that is where the pressure is heightened. And 2v2 is almost where it's the most chill and relaxed. However, it's so important to take those sets as you said, other teams recognizing that they need to pay more attention to 2v2 is huge. And that is a great lightning to get that Inferno Tower or Dragon on the tower. That is huge. Great play there by Misfits. Big, big advantages on both sides right now for Misfits. Of course, they are facing Golem. So we'll see how those pushes continue to build as we get closer to double elixir time. You know, I was going to comment on how, how much I, I appreciated the Lumberjack e -Wiz combination to take care of those Royal Hogs, yeah. but the Lightning clears it out, and there you go, Inferno Tower on the Dragon. Yeah, I felt the same way. I, I think, honestly, so did Team Liquid. I think they thought they had gotten that completely covered, and they could focus on their push here, and uh, no, Misfits had another answer for them. So Misfits going small and fast in comparison to the big beatdown of Surgical Goblin and Azili's, and a question is going to start building up as we get deeper in. That, I'll take a look. That was just such a great play there. Using the Lumberjack to go down the left lane and the Royal Hogs in the right, they knew that Team Liquid's only response was probably a Tombstone, not having a lot of their strongest ground counters in hand. Really, really great use of just recognizing your opponent's cycle and taking advantage of it. Absolutely, Andrew. I mean, that was a fantastic play. And again, this, this raises up this big question of with Golem Beatdown being the dominant 2v2 meta, you have to think so many teams are preparing for how to beat that. And as we get deeper into the season, will the Golem beatdown become more predictable and we'll see it getting cracked open more and more? Yeah, I believe so. And I think Pe Pekka is a big part of that uh, Golem, cracking the Golem key. Really, really small play here by Team Liquid, putting down the guards to pick up the one skeleton that was going to take the Prince's charge. If you guys can follow along with all of that, it's a really, really small thing, but it's huge in the long run, taking out the P.E.K.K.A. with their Prince. So now down to the final 20 seconds here, the wow. Lightning putting that right-hand tower in very dangerous position, and not a very fast deck from Surgical and Azizis. you got to wonder, how do they plan on getting this thing back 
with so little time remaining. Misfits on the precipice of of taking this thing here in 2v2. Wow, double great tombstone, or great double tombstone to bring that gold all the way across the lane. And wow, Misfits celebrating the huge, huge set win over Team Liquid, Surgical Goblin, and Azilis. Team Liquid still struggling to find their exact 2v2 rhythm. They made a slight adjustment, uh, making Surgical Goblin kind of the guy. But again, it's, it just shows you how hard 2v2 can be, even with two of the world's best. And here you go, Misfits, Reggae, and Pepe. Uh, now moving, Reggae himself moving now to a positive win record, three and two overall in 2v2 sets. Pepe evening it up, and here we go. You were talking about how do we deal. This was, we had a great defense, the lightning wiping those out, and this really feels like it set the tenor for the entire game. Yeah, and you look at the hands of Surgical and Azelius, and there was just nothing. Everything is all gray, and then again, you've got this great defense. The lightning comes in to clear up the Inferno Dragon. However, Misfits is like, nah, we got another tombstone. That golem's gonna go for a long, long walk. Wow, I, I admire Misfits for keeping their heads up and coming into this match with great confidence. Talking to Drege before the match, him saying that they have nothing to do other than just keep the confidence high. It's still early in the season. If you lose, step away from the game, recollect yourselves. I love it, and it paid off. We may be seeing a big shift in the 2v2 meta now, and it might be happening today specifically. It's been yeah. a lot of fun. But there's more Clash Royale action on its way. This match isn't over. Next up, 1v2. V1. You've seen them play 2v2. You've heard Rich and Andrew break it all down. By the way, good job, guys. Now, it's time for the 1v1 showdown. And this one should be good. Diego B and that one guy, let's get it on. A nice little show of sportsmanship beforehand for these two longtime competitors, Diego B and that one guy. A lot of interesting notes here. Diego B is currently with a 1-0 record in 1v1. That one guy looking not just for his first set win, but first game win. Yeah, that one guy having a really tough start here in head-to-head -head win rates. He hasn't won a match or a set in 1v1 or a 2v2 game. On the other side of that, you got Diego B, who's done great in 1v1 sets, but has struggled a little bit in King of the Hill. However, these two both looking to improve their head-to-head -head, head -head record. And our band cards here, Poison, been very common, but here we see the Tombstone, and you kind of, maybe if you're, if, you're, if you're Team Liquid, wish that Tombstone was banned in the last set. Yeah, it, totally. It was a big problem not having that, or it, it, that, those hogs last game. However, Tombstone being out of play takes a lot of decks archetype, just a little, it just makes them a little bit uncomfortable. So I'm really curious to see what they're going to do to, to replace it. Can Diego B send his team to King of the Hill, or will that one guy close this thing out for Misfits? Let's see right now. It is Diego B of Team Liquid at the top of your screen. That one guy for Misfits at the bottom. And Andrew, I talked to Diego B before this match, and he said uh, that one of the things he's been challenged with is uh, uh, kind of the shift in how he plays physically. And you think that wouldn't matter, but Diego B is used to competing, sitting down with his headphones on playing music. That's kind of how he gets in the zone. And he was expressing to me that, you know, the, the difference here at CRL, standing up, not having that sort of being in the zone music, definitely a challenge for him uh, to get out of his normal comfort zone. Yeah, it looks like uh, he's Diego's going to be running that uh, Mini P.E.K.K.A. Hog Rider Princess deck. Uh, really great job of that one guy stopping the Mini P.E.K.K.A. But I love that, Rich. Oh, 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 he's switching out the regular Hog Rider for the Royal Hogs. Very interesting, especially because uh, Tombstone's not in play. With your point, I love that because they've always say practice like you play, and it really, really matters. If you're used to sitting at home, listening to your music, relaxing, sitting back in a chair, when you come here to CRL, it's, it's white noise, it's game sound only. You're standing at a podium, everyone's watching you. That has a huge effect on a player's mentality. Can definitely change the way you play, and of course, both these players still trying to find their perfect rhythm here at CRL. You know, that one guy, also a very talented player in his own right. Uh, you know, he's been, he's been up near the top of the ladder, He's, he's performed in some of the big stages beforehand, but there's nothing like being here in the CRL arena. Yeah, and there's nothing like getting that very first win, whether it's a set or a match, that one guy is really dying for either of those. The log doing its work, taking the princess out, and it's gonna be enough to keep that mini P.E.K.K.A. off the tower, but the split hog push now, getting a nice advantage for Diego B. Yeah, Diego B taking control of the game right now. Not only is he feeling out his opponent, but he's also doing damage while doing that. 
So the Royal Ghost getting picked up at the very last second going corporeal, and there you see from distance, from way downtown, it's the Princess throwing down those buckets. Yeah, the Princess, when used correctly, is so powerful, but when she's not placed correctly, she can be such a non-factor. That is why she is so many pros' favorite card in the game. And here you see that one guy hesitating just a little bit here. You'll wonder with these quicker decks, might that be an issue? You know, there's been a lot of debate about the idea of, of Leaked Elixir, Andrew, about whether how important of a stat is it. And when you get to the beatdown meta, it, you know, you, you definitely do take some time longer with beatdown, but a lot of people saying that it might be more important with these faster decks where you're keeping cards on the board consistently. Absolutely. I mean, especially when you get in double elixir, if you can keep dropping units every single time you get to 10, it's just such a powerful thing. And Diego recognizing he made a slight misplay right there and paying for it. So now a lot coming down the line, the log taking out the princess, but down the right-hand side, once again, the royal hog push in the single lane, wow. getting that tower into significant danger, and here we go. This is breaking this thing wide open. We are almost to sudden death overtime, and now under 500 hit points is the right-hand tower yeah. of that one guy. Probably a rocket there maybe is the very last card for Diego, just waiting to get the log back and cycle maybe, or the, and also just the mini P.E.K.K.A. being such a great response to royal hogs. It just takes one hit, and he's going to send in his royal hogs. This is probably going to wrap it up. Well, it does get picked up by the fireball log combination, but I really love that he did the three and one split, doing a little bit more damage on the left-hand side, just in case you need it. Yeah, I love that princess at the river and that goblin gang behind the ice goal. Really, really nice, aggressive play that also protected his princess. As I've said before, you always protect your princess, and Diego got the message. Nerves, no problem here for Diego B. Maybe standing to starting to finally feel kind of good as he takes that right-hand tower down and getting a game win for Team Liquid, so important here to not have to be feel like you have to win two in a row to save your team's life. Yeah, and then you look at the flip side of that coin, that one guy's got to be feeling a lot of pressure. It looked like it was going to be maybe his game, but uh, honestly, Diego just made a few small plays throughout that kind of just stole it from him. Um, now he's really got to bounce back. Fantastic work. Yeah, Team Liquid here f looking like they're in, in a good position to move up the standings. Things are so close right now. Diego B trying to close things out in game number two. Game number two on its way. Diego B trying to get the victory here, send his team to King of the Hill overtime. That one guy still searching for his first game win in the 1v1 set. And an aggressive Lava Hound coming down. Diego says, all right, you got a Lava Hound? I got a Lava Hound. The Hounds will meet not quite at the river, but they'll say hello as they pass like ships in the night, <laughs> heading for each other's towers. So far an exact mirror play here. It makes a lot of sense, Mega Minion getting on that, not allocating too much elixir to support or defend. And picked up very well by the Inferno Dragon. So not a lot going on there on offense in this moment for Diego B. A little extra damage there for that one guy on the right-hand tower. And as you see the difference in how they defend here, it's, it's always very interesting to see the, re or the, the way that pros decide to defend differently. And, and now we're going to see how that plays out through the match. And the guards picking up the Inferno Dragon, so no damage there. Interesting note, that one guy running the Goblin Gang in this deck, not a typical card you see with this pairing. Yeah, I mean, I, one thing that is tough with Lava Hound is it doesn't have a lot of ground responses, so that's probably that one guy's idea. Now, Diego B running the more traditional response, which is guards. So now we see the, the competing Lava Loon pushes here, and uh, it looks like a, the, the Inferno Dragon not going to pick up, though. Really nice play here. Both guys look like they're about to get tower on, on their respective sides. But, you know, a very nice work there with the slight distraction to keep the Inferno Dragon off that balloon. And now going to get some tower damage as well as Diego B. Yeah, and what you recognize there is that one guy had to allocate more elixir to defend with the extra Mega Minion because that balloon was so healthy going into the King Tower. With this double Lava Loon, you got to keep both towers healthy because it's so easy for your opponent, once damage has been dealt to one tower specifically, to just go for it. And now, interesting, Andrew, we also have the guards from that one guy, so playing guards and Goblin Gang. And you see the wow coming out from Diego B being kind of confused by this sort of uh, deck composition. They usually don't need that many ground responses in a Lava Loon deck. So you got to wonder what the thinking is behind those uh, that Goblin Gang in this deck. And now the balloon for Diego B getting all the way to tower. The question here, though, is does he have enough here to stop 
and a nice pull to the top with the cannon on that on that balloon. Wow, wow beautiful play, and might have just been a split second within time by Diego B. Yeah, and a really, really great defense there by Diego B, and that one guy really feeling the pressure now of that small misplays throughout, or maybe Diego just outplayed him by a little bit. Maybe uh, that one guy was going with this specific deck to maybe meet that princess deck that Diego was running before. Who knows, but all I know is today in the Lava Hound battle, Diego outplayed our good friend, that one guy. Wow, that final sequence there, unbelievable performance by Diego B. I mean, look at the, 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 the plays he made back to back to back. He takes the Inferno Dragon, uh, distracts it from his balloon, slides it through there onto the tower, gets tower, gets king tower damage. And then on the other side, you know, just when you think that maybe, maybe that one guy making a run at the king tower, just the perfectly placed, perfectly timed cannon pulls it away. Yeah, that, that balloon went, it seemed like, all the way across the map with that incredible cannon pull. Diego B just really, really not making any mistakes throughout. And as we've noticed, a lot of pros are going to make one or two throughout, but this was not the case. And as you see here, the Inferno Dragon, distracted by the Mega Minion, doesn't get on top of the Lava Hound, doesn't get on top of the Balloon, and it's completely healthy, which is why that one guy is forced again to drop a Mega Minion here, putting him at a bigger Elixir disadvantage. And here again, you see the Inferno Dragon not doing its job, letting the Balloon all the way through, getting that tower, and then just at the very last second, I mean, look at that. There is, you could not have made one slight change. Any Anything goes wrong with that pull there, and Diego B's in danger of losing his King Tower. Yeah, and I understand the position that that one guy was in, playing the Inferno Dragon where he was. The reason why is because he'd lost his other King Tower. He can't just play it in the middle because Diego can then distract it very, very easily. He played it as best he could, but he was just not in the right position to make those plays matter. And, well, the position is all important now. We are headed to King of the Hill. Each team nominates three players, of course, and each player gets just one chance to show up for their squad. The first team to eliminate all three players from the other side takes the set and takes the match victory. And the stakes are very big in this one, so of course the choices they're going to make in that lineup, in their card bands, might we see some shifts? Might we even see Buffmac make a surprise appearance here for Team Liquid? We will find out right now when we go inside the war rooms. Well. Pepe, first, that one second, Rere, third, Van, Nido, okay, just follow the strategy, we have selected the decks that we like or we want to use, and only I need to do this, and like in 2v2, we need to be confident and to be sure that we are playing. Yeah, that's all. That's all. The Come. Balloon. Uh, concentrate on the game, okay? Okay, guys, so we made it to King of the Hill. Uh, so far, we didn't do that well in King of the Hill, but we practiced it a lot, and recently we have been doing really well, so I'm actually really confident for this one. We got unlucky in the two first two, but Diego swept in the one first one. But since he just played, I'll put him last. As you said that you're really confident in this meta, so I'll put you number one. I'll go second since Diego will go last. I'll just put SG. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I can rest. Diego can rest and prepare yes. his decks. As I said, like he just played his one first one. Hopefully you will not have to play. Hopefully me and Asilis will finish it before. Yep. But just or in just case. Me. <laughs> or just Asilis. Hopefully I don't even have to play. But let's do this, guys. guys. Yeah, mm. let's go liquid at three. Uh, One, one two, two, three, let's, let's go, go liquid. liquid! When this began, we all hoped that it would go the distance. Well, guess what? Ask and ye shall receive. Will Misfits pull off the upset for their first CRL win? Or will Liquid stomp on their dreams? It's time for King of the Hill to settle it once and for all, or at least for now. Ton riding on the next few minutes here, Andrew. For Team Liquid, a win here would move them up the standings after Dignitas' loss, putting them potentially in second place, at least in those playoff spots. On the other side, Misfits, a loss here would put them in a situation where they practically need to win out to make the playoffs. Yeah, as you said, a huge, huge moment. Everything riding on this. Pepe starting off. He's one one King of the Hill. Behind that is that one guy and Reggae. Reggae with the best King of the Hill record for Misfits at 2-1. and one. 
and of course their opponents, Azili's kicking off, still looking for his very first King of the Hill victory, followed by Surgical Goblin and Diego B, who just closed out that 1v1 set. Anything can happen in King of the Hill, and of course we have banned cards active for all potential five games. Tornado banned by Misfits. Taking the balloon off the board is Team Liquid. Yeah, that balloon, we've seen how in it can be in the last seconds of the game, either taking the set or pushing the match into overtime. It's crazy what can happen with that balloon. But also interesting with the balloon being out of play, there has been that Lava Hound minor deck. Maybe we might see that instead of a Lava Loon deck. A lot of possibilities. King of the Hill coming up right now. You know, Andrew, one thought about that balloon ban is we have seen so many teams play a perfect game and then a balloon just slides through at the end and changes thing. And it feels kind of like Team Liquid looking to take some of the uh, some of the chance off the board. Yeah, I mean, if, I've, if I feel like I'm the better player, right, that means that the only way I'm going to lose is if my opponent gets lucky. They want to take that completely, completely out of the way. So again, just to remind you of these uh, of the stakes here, because it really is a critical juncture for both these teams. I mentioned it just a moment ago, but Team Liquid here, if a win puts them at three and two, there's been a lot of talk about them not playing all the way to their best, but three and two puts them not just in playoff contention, but contention for that second place spot in the European region. Yeah, and like you said, if Misfits loses, they've basically got to win out for the season. Now, I've said time and time again, I thoroughly believe it's better to lose the beginning of the season than later on to figure out all those kinks, kind of work it out, and that way towards playoff season, towards when it really matters, you've got exactly what you need, but you never want to be in a position to just have to win out. Yeah, an 0-6 hole, a big one to come back from the Mega Knight now, picking up those two Musketeers on the left-hand side quite beautifully. But again, talking about that whole, you know, the, there's there's the possibility that a 7-7 seven and seven team could make it into the playoffs, but with the wow. way that it's been here so far, it feels like you need to be 8-6. Yes, I couldn't agree more, and I love this deck that Pepe's running. I've actually had a, a lot of fun with it myself, and the idea of the Mega Knight basically tanking for that bandit. So the Mega Knight crosses the river, then takes the focus from the Princess Tower. The bandit dashes in front of it, helps clean up the DPS troops, and then dashes on the tower unaffected. Very, very great synergy, and you throw the Miner there on top of it. That tower's at 900 health. A big Early lead here for Pepe, putting Azili's on his heel. Uh, you know, we see him splitting the, the Musketeers and going with the, the correct call, putting the two on the right-hand side away from his damage tower. Still, though, that poison going to be a hard thing to overcome for those three Musketeers. Absolutely, and here's the other thing. He's also got Mega Knight, and I knew it. I knew the Royal Hogs were going to come in. Mega Knight is such a wonderful response to the three Musketeers and the Royal Hogs. You saw right there he dropped it on the Solo Musketeer and the Royal Hogs. He used the Bandit to clean up the other lane, but now he's got a great push here coming down the left-hand lane. Pepe, the number one CRL EU qualifier, making an early statement here in game number one of King of the Hill. He is not afraid to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best in the world. And I feel like Azili's got away with one there. He might have played it exactly perfectly, but if that Ice Golem had pulled the Bandit even one more tile over, then it would have dashed to the Hunter, probably taking that left tower. Great for him that it did not. So at 4.58, that left-hand tower in a lot of trouble for Azili's. Pepe has to be feeling pretty good. Of course, he cannot afford to make a single mistake right now. The Mega Knight picking up on the left yeah. on the right hand side, but the left hand side a lot of damage going down that lane, and not a lot of elixir left for Pepe. Uh, having to use the miner there on defense was the right call. World Ghost is still going to get a few hits off, but he's he's still in the drivers. Oh wow! But the bandit going the wrong direction is not what and he wanted. And that's going to be it. Oh wow. my gosh! You know, that was so close. Wow, Andrew, you said it yourself. The bandit, you really hoped it would follow uh, back to its defensive side. Yeah. Goes the opposite direction. You know, you look at that ice goal and pick up. I was worried about the ice goal and picking up the Mega Knight and delivering it to the hands of that left-hand tower. But it's the bandit instead that does the deed. Yeah, that was very, very impressive. Honestly, Azilis was probably thinking he might get away with one. I thought he might as well. But the bandit doing work, going across the river, getting to the tower, great, great dash to take the first Ooh. game here in this King of the Hill set. That's a very important game. Momentum, of course, so key here in King of the Hill. And, uh, you know, Pepe off to a great start, but across from him right now, uh, a guy you never want to be standing no. in front of when the pressure is on. It's one of the best in the world, Surgical Goblin. I've seen a lot of his uh, YouTube videos, and a lot of opponents have the exact same response when they see themselves across him in a match, and that is to say, laugh, good luck, good game, and laugh again. So <laughs> here we go. Game number two of King of the Hill on its way.
So a lot of you at home know the number one global ladder player, Surgical Goblin, of course, with that 700,000 subscriptions on YouTube. So many of you probably watch his videos at home. Here, seeing him up against a player that many of you might not know as well, the Italian Pepe. And now it's Pepe's turn to open up with Royal Hogs, switching it up in game number two. Yeah, probably going to see Royal Hogs, Three Musketeers, maybe from both of them? Who knows? Very possible and uh, interesting choice. Yeah, so see the Royal Hogs now from, uh, from Surgical Goblin. And the Magic Archer here making an appearance for Pepe. Yeah, I like that. I like the Magic Archer being used as cleanup for the Royal Hogs, dropping it in the middle, being able to shoot at both incoming uh, barrages. But obviously not a ton of damage when uh, you know when push comes to shove later on in the match. He's going to have to use more than Look just that. Look at that log play, Andrew. Wonderful. Wow. That is the kind of next level play that makes huge, huge changes in the match. That was a great log. However, him recognizing, well, I had a great log and it may have got the Magic Archer on the tower, but then I misplayed my defense and we're back to square one. So a pretty aggressive deck so far from Surgical Goblin, of course, both guys with the Royal Hogs, but Surge opting to try to put the pressure on here against the less experienced player. Yeah, and, 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 and who knows if it, that was what it happened right there with experience. Pepe playing his Magic Archer in the back, Surge throwing in those Royal Hogs immediately, only having the Mega Minions to respond. He ends up taking about 500 damage. And this would be the, the, the interaction at the bridge over and over and over again. Surgical Goblin trying to find a way to turn that Magic Archer the wrong direction. We saw the, hog, the log play before, getting it back in that lineup. But you got to wonder how, how many times can Surgical Goblin turn that thing away, and can Pepe find a way to get that target where he wants it? Yeah, because we've seen time and time again, when that Magic Archer locks on the tower, it can be so devastating for the person who is playing against it. The Magic Archer Royal Hog combination, or uh, sorry, and... Uh, Royal Ghost combination slicing through those Royal Hogs, but the damage is done down to 9.02 as we're in double elixir time. It is Surgical Goblin of Team Liquid here in the lead. Yeah, with the late P.E.K.K.A. coming down, <clears throat> Surge is probably going to do his best to just kite it with the Ice Golem and use the Hunter to pick it up. And wiping away the Skeletons is the Log. The Hunter now going to get at least two shots off the Ice Golem having to be dropped in its way. Nice fireball, Surgical Goblin defending on all fronts. Yep, never losing his cool is one thing I've recognized with Surge. No matter how far behind he is, even if he's not behind or even if he's lost a tower early on, he's never out of the game. This P.E.K.K.A., though, a very interesting piece in this deck. You know, you don't look at Surge's deck and think there's a bunch of stuff to work with here that, it's, that it should be countering. But so far, the P.E.K.K.A. has been a major part of what's been happening for Pepe. Great fireball by Surge. However, this is a lot of damage coming down the right side lane for uh, Pepe here with the Royal Ghost and the Royal Hogs on that tower. So now it's Surgical Goblin. Both towers, a lot of damage. And this now it's the Magic it. Archer. Wow. Oh my gosh, that Pepe. Magic Archer. We talked about it early on, and it up. did it again. The Magic Archer, when connecting, is just so powerful. Surge not being able to control all the units on the board. Just got let that get away from him. And here we are. It's a huge moment. Again, we were talking about that, that P.E.K.K.A. and how it didn't really seem like it was a great defensive answer, but how it had played so much of a role on the opposite side of the board, making problems, making Surge have to spend Elixir to deal with it. And here we go, making room for that Magic Archer to get itself on the tower. And now we are in a very interesting Ooh, position. Misfits yeah. seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Azili's down, Surgical Goblin down, and now it's Diego B that has to win out. He has to win all three of these King of the Hill matches to bring it home for Team Liquid. And on the other side, that we got Misfits that are looking to finally claim their very first victory over one of the most famous teams in the world. Big moments here. It's King of the Hill. Can Pepe do it one more time? And once more, Diego B, top of your screen. Now, he already has showed up pretty well in head-to-head -head matchups with that nice sweep he had against that one guy. Can he continue the mojo here against Pepe? But Pepe, you know, has to be feeling good. Just took out two of the best in the world back-to-back. -back. And just misses those a couple of those goblins with that log. Still hits the tombstone. Man, I am freaking out right now. <laughs> this is so crazy. And I'm sure that Pepe is doing all that he can to try to remain calm. It's so important in these moments to just remain calm. Yeah, you're probably not the only one freaking out here. Uh, this is this is a pretty big moment again for both teams. You know, Team Liquid still does have a lot of options. This is very early in the season for them. This is only their fifth game, but this being the sixth, uh, that's the sixth game 
for for uh, for Misfits. This is kind of a big important moment here. Now playing Graveyard on both sides. Yeah, I was gonna say it looks exactly like a double Graveyard. You see the Mega Minion, the Tombstone, and the Electro Wiz. You think that, and the same thing on the other side: Tombstone, Ice Golem, Inferno Dragon. You gotta think Graveyard win condition for both players. However, decks being slightly different. I'm interested to see how this is gonna play out, especially because we're not used to seeing Spear Goblins work their way into these Graveyard decks. I was gonna ask you about that, Andrew. How do you feel about about the Spear Goblins making their appearance here? I think the idea for them is to kind of help pick up whatever squishy uh, air units like bats or minions or maybe uh, even like uh guards just to throw behind uh, their tank, which is ideally going to be either the Ice Golem or the Inferno Dragon. But now that he's up against a graveyard deck, how do you see that card working its way in? I, 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 I'm not sure, honestly. They both got poisons in hand to respond to each other's graveyards. Now, this is what's interesting is when people use their defensive uh, poisons off their towers, it leaves them vulnerable to a graveyard push. Now, in, in single elixir, you don't have to be as cautious because, you know, the opponent doesn't have as much elixir to play with, but that's still an interesting play. Tombstone played high and inside by Diego B. Now, often Tombstone, a, 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 one of the many cards you can counter that, that graveyard push with here, do you think that Tombstone being that far outside kind of a trouble spot? Uh, slightly, but I understand that he's probably going for the uh, guards to be his main Tombstone defense. So here we now seeing the entire makeup and Pepe with a couple of interesting cards here for the graveyard deck, including the Rascals as well. Yeah, and here we are with those Spear Goblins getting behind the Ice Golem, trying to clean up those guards, getting another Tombstone down to defend against the Graveyard. Diego does a good job of picking up most of that damage. So as we get closer to Sudden Death Overtime, Diego needing to get the victory here. How do you feel about his chances against what you're seeing now from Pepe? It's interesting. This is like a very, very close matchup. It's really going to be about how these players take advantage of the other one making a mistake, whether it's going to be if they force them to have to use their poison because they don't defend adequately, or if you get such a strong counter push that they have to use a poison then. Uh, I'm not sure, but I feel like what's going to happen is poison's going to be out of cycle when needed, and a graveyard's going to be devastating for one of these two players. Well, the guard's doing a great job mixed with the Mega Minion picking up that graveyard push. I think maybe one tick of damage at most, and now it's Diego B pressing the advantage. He has a support troops coming down the left-hand lane, and he has poison and graveyard on that tower, getting down now under 600, and might get under 500. No, stays at 622 here, 30 seconds into sudden death overtime. And you got to wonder if it's just the slight differences in deck here of Pepe running a slightly off meta of this great of this deck that essentially is that Diego B is running is basically the meta slightly uh, just the slightly different, but whereas Pepe's is is very different. I'll take a look here, Andrew. On the left hand side, this looks like it could be very close. The poison defensively does pick up most of that, but if that E Wiz can stay alive for another half second, gets picked up, but still at 331, you gotta think Diego B's feeling pretty good right now. Yeah, he's definitely probably gonna take this game here. He, he's gotta just get in another poison and another log. He's gotta defend this really well, which he can do with his guards and his tombstone. Looks like Diego's gonna push this to the next game here in King of the Hill. Down to 113, it's just gonna take that poison. That is it, Diego B pulling things out for his team, keeping Liquid alive and taking out Pepe after two big wins though. The, the Italian has to be feeling pretty good about himself. Yeah, I mean, we can see how quickly things change. Now, obviously, Misfit's still here at an advantage, but that one guy is still looking for his very first King of the Hill. And as we see here in our replay, it's, it's very similar decks. However, like I said during the match, I believe that Diego B's more classic archetype, more classic meta around this graveyard deck is the reason why he took that match. Well, it does bring up a really interesting question, Andrew. Like, you know, the, the people try to play off meta to be surprising, but the meta's the meta for a reason. It's because it works. Yeah, it's because it works. And honestly, if cards in your deck aren't banned that are a necessity in that deck makeup, then why change it? And, and Diego didn't need to. He, he didn't have to. And it really kind of took the advantage in that matchup. So here we go. Up next, it's that one guy who currently is 0 and 8 in head to head matchups. Can Diego close him out here and get one step closer to the victory? One more time, reminder your band cards, Tornado and Balloon, taking some of that, that uh, burst danger, that last second slide through and take it from you off the board is Team Liquid. Now, Andrew, we've talked a bit about the pressure. Who do you think feels the pressure more right now? Diego B back to the wall with this big reputation. He has to defend for Team Liquid. Or is it Reggae who, or not Reggae, sorry, that one guy who might be facing somewhat of a referendum on his 1v1 skills here? 
I'm, I'm honestly not positive, but I feel like by playing the Mega Knight on the Goblin Barrel, it might be that one guy who's feeling the pressure, because that's a really a huge elixir trade uh, that's negative for him, and then sending a, ne a Mega Knight down the lane by itself is really never that advantageous. And it also shows one of your strongest win conditions early on. So looking like Diego B playing that new Prince log bait meta that's been showing up so much since the Prince got that 5% buff. And you can see right there by that one guy playing the log there on this Royal Ghost that is now on his tower. It's just he had a really rough starting hand to go up against a log bait deck. Not having log in hand, having to use the Mega Knight to clean up, already setting the Royal Ghost down. Just tough. So slowing down a little bit here, that one guy getting his miner in the back, picked up though by the Goblin Gang. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is Diego's gonna be able to pick up that miner, I'd say maybe eight times out of 10 between the Rascals and the Goblin Gang. It's gonna be tough for that one guy to get the miner to connect to the tower. Now we've seen the Rascals and the Prince together in bait decks a whole bunch. Often that synergy where you drop the Prince in the middle, pushing the big Rascal forward. That, but right now... Yeah, D Diego recognizes that was a pretty big misplay. He knew that that one guy was just a slight behind an elixir. Now, he did get uh, the Mega Knight down, but that still, Diego feels like he's in quite strong control of this game. Prince meeting the Mega Knight, but with support from the minions, the Mega Knight might escape enough for one Ooh. big leap. A lot of damage on that tower. Yeah, there you go. That one guy putting the right-hand tower in significant duress. Great job by that one guy, turning the tables right there. And Diego recognized it. We've said it so many times here at Zero. If you're playing a log bait style deck, and no matter how well you're playing at that moment where you incur massive amounts of damage, it swings the game in the opponent's favor heavily. And there you go. Now the log perfectly in cycle for that one guy. And he has a really great shot here. A lot of opportunities to close this thing out. If he drops this tower, you got to wonder, does Diego have any sort of answer with just 25 seconds left to get this thing back under control? No, and you can see him trying to create dual lane pressure here. But as you can see, uh, that one guy just not that bothered by it. Knowing that the left-hand tower can take a decent amount of damage, knowing that the right-hand tower is basically dead, this is going to be it. That wow. one guy doing it for his team, doing it for Misfits. Wow. They finally get in that win column. What a great day to be a Misfit. If there is any place to get your first head-to-head -head win at CRL, this is it. There, that one guy, he got put into this lineup again one more time in King of the Hill after really struggling. You see his team is so happy. They didn't just take the win today. They took the win against probably the single most stacked team possibly across all the regions here at CRL, EU, and North America. And now we got to look at the fact that Team Liquid is coming off of two losses in a row, one of which to a team that hadn't found one yet. Huge moment for Misfits. I love it. These guys came in today ready to fight, ready to go to battle, and Team Liquid did not underestimate them, but they just did not have it in the cards today. The decks were just not there, and they got slightly outplayed by a team that has been dying, dying to get that first W, Rich. Well, you know, let me tell you something, Andrew. I think this all comes back to that 2v2 set. You know, you had Misfits. Uh, we talked about the predictability of all, all those golden beatdown decks over and over again. Oh, yes. And team's been trying to figure out how to be the one to crack it. Misfits came out with that 2v2 goal, like deck to beat the golem, and they got the win. Now here is the end, the big moment. It's, it's, it's not the, quite the finish, but that, that big leap he just, they could not pick up. Diego could not pick up that Mega Knight. And that right there changed everything. These guys were both playing slightly out of cycle and slightly behind an elixir. And it was the fact that that one guy capitalized so well, that miner changed everything. Taking the princess off the table, not being able to clean up those minions, allowed the Mega Knight to get to the tower. Then the minions do with absurd damage with their fast attack speed. One play changed everything. And that one guy is no longer without a win in King of the Hill, in head to head. He did it for himself and his team today. One more, once more. Come on, this is teamwork. This is teamwork. You did great. Let's continue like this. Come on, guys. Here starts the comeback. Eh? This is the Here comeback. We're just gonna win every single game from now on. <laughs> Am I right? Right. Yes. Let's oh, just the idea. And such a sh such a show of emotion from all these guys. And again, I'm gonna go back to that two v two. It was that deck that beat the golem beat down that really changed everything. That set this thing up. If they had not won that two v two set, uh, you know, you don't know if that one guy would have shown up in one v one. But right now, he showed up in King of the Hill and uh, an emotional and excited that one guy is standing by with Christy St. John. Thanks guys. Your first win and against Team Liquid. I mean, 
it's emotional. How you feeling? Uh, honestly, I just I feel great. I'm proud of our entire team uh, for the way we performed today. I didn't do my best in 1v1, but uh, everyone just had my back and reassured me that I could get it in King of the Hill. A team effort. And the pressure you were under, I mean, you came back from 1v1 to beat your opponent in King of the Hill. How did you keep calm and collected so you could take that W? Uh, I took a really good mid-game advantage after copying Pepe's deck because obviously if he's having success with it, I know I could too. Uh, I had a really good matchup and uh, I noticed that he kind of just overcommitted on one of his pushes and just kind of forced a Mega Knight in. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to ask, now you have one win and it feels amazing, but you're still behind in the standings. How are you going to keep that momentum to win nearly every game so you can really be a strong competitor here? Uh, as we've and other teams have proven, any team can win on any given day. And so we're just going to keep doing exactly what we did today. Uh, we changed up our training a little bit because obviously it wasn't working out for us. And you can see we won today. So uh, our next goal is just to keep pushing, make playoffs, any team can do it. You have proven that any team can do it. Great game today, great play. Back to you guys. On any given day, any team can win at CRL, and today is the day for Misfits taking that all-important first victory and turning that bagel into a one on our stands. <laughs> yeah, as we get into our standings here, you'll see neither team actually moving with the win and the loss. However, a huge shift in momentum. Team Liquid coming off two losses in a row. And then you got Misfits finally getting their first win, but over Team Liquid. So they're feeling great. I'm sure they can't wait for the next match. Not a lot of movement, a lot of momentum, though. Yeah, these two, these two changes here, uh, what they do is they really tighten up the standings, yeah. making it as we get to the midpoint of the season, everything's going to get more and more heated. The stakes will get higher and higher, match by match. And you can follow all that action by hitting subscribe on the Clash Royale eSports page, going to esports.clashroyale.com, and of course, going to the eSports tab in your Clash Royale app. We will be back with more European action here on Saturday, September. 15th. Make sure you tune in. Some fantastic action coming your way. For Andrew Guy, I'm Rich Slayton. We will see you back here on Saturday in the arena. Bye. Our time on Earth is marked by the great events we are fortunate to witness. Today was one of those days. Those misfits really kicked donkey. These CRL stars shined brighter than a golden chest as they battled for supremacy. Somehow, the action in this arena grows more intense each week. And unbelievably, there's so much more to come on the road to the World Finals. I am a king, and this is an order. Subscribe to the Clash Royale eSports channel. And remember, never look directly at an Inferno Tower. It's not good for your eyes.